Scourge Arrow is one of the most interesting skills in Path of Exile. It has a lot of complicated mechanics, which often lead to the skill being misunderstood. So today, I'm going to shed some light on why you might be having problems with Scourge Arrow, and get into some issues that are faced not only by Scourge Arrow, but bow and melee builds in general, so be sure to stick around to the end to hear that. For now, let's start with the basics. How does Scourge Arrow work? It's a channeling attack skill. As you channel, you'll build up stacks. When you release the skill, it will fire an arrow that drops Thorn Arrow pods behind it. The Thorn Arrow pods, after a short time, will then detonate, releasing Thorn Arrows. One important thing to note about this interaction, each Thorn Arrow pod is its own source, so the Thorn Arrows from one firing of Scourge Arrow can, quote-unquote, shotgun. If you drop six pods, one Thorn Arrow from each pod can hit the same target. However, primary arrows are, like all other projectiles in PoE, and cannot shotgun. These projectiles also have infinite pierces, so you don't get to use things like fork or chain to modify their behavior. Additional arrows change Scourge Arrow's behavior in a very interesting way, and this is where I think a lot of the confusion comes. Because once you have two or more primary arrows, the pods will be randomly distributed among the arrows. It seems like there's some sort of algorithm here that tries to prevent it from impacting with a wall and dropping no pods, though a little bit more about that later. What this means is you can aim to further fine-tune and control the behavior of a skill. This is why it is one of the best bow skills in the game, from a mechanics perspective, if you want to have both very good single target and very good clear. I say from a mechanics perspective, because when it was first released back in Delve, it was actually just one of the strongest bow skills in the game, and it's since been nerfed several times. What this behavior means is, if you want to have as much single target overlap as possible, more primary projectiles are good. With greater multiple projectiles, all the pods drop on a little cluster right where my cursor is. This means I can kind of put my cursor right over an enemy and they'll always be shotgunned by every single pod dropped. If you use two arrows, the general recommended number, you can keep your cursor very close to your character to form a very tight V with the pods. This will cause a high number of overlaps. On the other hand, if you want to clear with a skill, you can aim your cursor towards the edge of your screen. And depending on projectile speed, the pods will also drop closer or farther away. Solar projectile support, therefore, means the thorn arrows will travel a shorter distance, less coverage, but the pods will cluster closer together, thus making it a lot easier to use for single target overlaps. Faster projectile support, on the other hand, will cause the thorn arrows to travel farther and also cause the pods to be spread out more. This is because the pods drop from a main arrow at fixed time intervals, so the faster the arrow is moving, the more distance it covers as it's dropping these pods. Therefore, if you want to clear two entire screens with a single attack, using Scourge Arrow with faster projectiles or other things that increase projectile speed and no additional arrows is absolutely the best way to go. Now you might be thinking, why don't you just add five or six arrows all the time, since adding more arrows means that the pods drop closer together and therefore cluster better for single target. The issue here is, if the primary arrow hits a wall, it will not spawn any further pods. It gets stuck in the wall and its travel comes to an end. Therefore, you want as few arrows as possible to avoid them getting stuck on things like doorways. This used to be a serious issue back when the skill was new, but over time, GGG has made the doorway hitboxes a lot more generous, and now you can kind of aim through, especially with two arrows, by placing your cursor farther away, thus forcing your pods into more of a line and less of a V. For an example of this, you can see the footage right now where I am clearing a relatively enclosed map with a pretty easy time of it. It's not perfect, I lose a few pods, but it's more than enough to deal damage to everything around me. So how does Scourge Arrow interact with Mirage Archer and Ballista support? Well, things like Mirage Archer, Ballista, and Reflections are a little bit wonky with channeling skills. They don't quite understand them. So Scourge Arrow will always attempt to channel to maximum and then fire through a target. This can run into issues where it fires into a wall because you're placing the ballista on the opposite side of the enemy and facing it right through the wall. Instead, when you're trying to fight enemies with Scourge Arrow Mirage Archer or Scourge Arrow Ballista, you want to stay away from walls as much as possible and possibly use an open layout like you can see on screen right now. Part of the issue with this is Scourge Arrow was designed back in Delve League and the game's design has become, well, a lot more complex now. This was long before ballista support was really a thing. Instead, it was ranged attack totem, and ranged attack totems were not very good, so I don't think many people were thinking about or using them. In fact, I think Scourge Arrow was largely envisioned as a self-attack skill, which made sense for a very long time. 
Sure, you could use Mirage Archer, but Mirage Archer was much more of a clear tool with a little bit of single target augment, and you'd only really need it on boss fights like Shaper, which take place in an arena far away from walls. Don't get me wrong, you can still do it, and Mirage Archer is still great for clear. But if you're using Scourge Arrow Ballista, you do want to be careful of placement, because Scourge Arrow is a highly positional skill. This means that Scourge Arrow in its current state is very good at clearing. With two projectiles, it can become a decent single target skill as well. You should always focus on the self attack version. It's pretty mediocre with Mirage Archer or Ballista support. So for example, in my Scourge Arrow setup right now, I'm using Scourge Arrow as my self attack and clear skill, and then I'm using a Siege Ballista as my single target. This negates all of the problems that Scourge Arrow has, and I can stick my Ballista right next to a wall without any concerns. In general, like a lot of other bow skills, Scourge Arrow particularly excels in open areas. Next up though, I wanted to talk about a very important problem that you run into with Ballista support, and even Ancestral Warchief and Ancestral Protector. Before I do though, a quick reminder that if this has helped to educate you about the mechanics of Scourge Arrow, please do leave a like as that helps me out a ton. For more content, such as details on this build's mechanics, get subscribed, or for more content immediately, you can click through the card after watching this video to check out my second channel, where I talk about the differences between a prestige system and a paragon system, and why one tends to encourage people to keep playing a game, and the other tends to push them away from it. Before I get back to things, a special thanks to my patrons and channel members for the continued support, making videos just like this one possible. So what is this big problem with ballista support? It's that self-attack bow builds kind of suck, and self-attack melee builds kind of suck as well. Ballista support has been so ubiquitous and easy to integrate, so powerful, that in a sense, the modern bow build is heavily reliant on it. Similarly, Ancestral Warchief and Ancestral Protector can often be over one gem link's worth of damage, so if you're not integrating it into your attack or melee build, you're playing at a significant deficit. And this is where things get really bad. I think temporary buffs are totally fine. I like that GGG is moving towards a more active playstyle, where you can use temporary buff skills, and this will help fix problems you'd otherwise encounter, such as using Tornado for a skill that clears really well, but has lackluster single target. The problem here is that with ranged attack builds and melee builds, especially ranged attack builds where the totems are a lot of your damage, totems are pretty squishy on non-totem builds. This is especially the case in the new uber bosses. So while I'm very much in favor of supporting skills encouraging more active playstyles, I don't like the fact that your temporary buffs can easily die. And if you don't like supporting skills in general, things like Righteous Fire, Death's Oath, or Auto Bombers tend to have relatively few of those, and you can kind of passively go through the game if what you're looking for from your PoE experience is in fact a walking simulator. This is a problem that minions have also had for a very long time. For as long as I can remember, buff specters or buff zombies have been a thing in minion builds. And they also tended to die, which leads to the annoyance of possibly having to resummon some stuff, or on the more extreme end, having to replace a multiple divine animated guardian. Now to be fair, on actual minion builds, having your minions die hasn't been that much of an issue throughout most of PoE's history. And similarly, on an actual ranged attack totem or ballista build, or an actual ancestral warchief build, your totems are reasonably survivable. It doesn't feel so bad to take totem defenses, totem life, or totem resists, when you're building around totems in every way. But it does feel really bad to path to those nodes when you're using ballistas as an add-in on what would otherwise be a self-attack build, except for the fact that self-attack just isn't strong enough to be competitive currently in Path of Exile. It's somewhat of a problem that minion players have been facing in 319, where as a result of all the changes, unless you're heavily investing into minion survivability, they tend to be a bit squishy, though as the league's gone on, that has been addressed more and more. And so we have a problem. Your single target damage on a lot of ranged attack builds, or a lot of melee builds, is reliant on you being able to use totems. These totems will be 30 to 50 to 80% of your single target damage depending on how you build your character. Unfortunately, they're also a huge liability. There's times where you'll spend more of your time spamming new totems because the boss is killing them about as fast as you can summon them, than you actually attacking the boss and feeling like you're participating in the fight. Sure, some people just want to have that totem build feel, and want to have the totems do things for them. But it certainly doesn't feel great when you're forced to do that, because that's where most of your single target comes from. A couple examples of really good totem situations would be if your Ancestral Warchief was running Combustion 
on a fire conversion build. Sure, combustion will shred the enemy res, and you won't have to worry about that too much yourself. In fact, you could maybe even run Ellie Focus and not worry about it at all. It's shifted over to the totem, and that works pretty similarly to something like a Stormbrand, except for again, the totem could die and the Stormbrand can't, but if that's all it was doing, it would probably get enough hits in to keep the combustion up a decent amount of the time and you wouldn't feel the pressing need to constantly resummon it. Similarly, a Withering Touch Blast Rain set up on Toxic Rain or a Poison build. This won't really do very much damage, but it will certainly get a lot of Wither stacks going. But if your totems happen to get killed on a boss, you can fall back on Withering Step, or at a higher budget you can use a Timeless Jewel and not need the support totem entirely. When totems are truly support, I think they're fine. And if the totem dies, it's a small detriment, but it doesn't completely ruin your single target. So I'd like to see more options to redistribute the power back towards self-attack, lessen the effect of the buffs from ancestral totems on melee builds, and possibly lessen the damage of ballista builds for builds that aren't heavily invested into them. Cut it down to, let's just say, 30% of your character's total power at best, and give all the rest back to self-attack so that when I'm playing a bow build, I feel like I'm playing a bow build, rather than playing a totem build. Alternatively, give totems a much higher baseline in terms of defenses. I realize that some problems could arise here from health scaling things, dark pack totems are very notably a thing, but I'm sure there's a way to make totems take less damage or have extra resistances that doesn't require that their health increase. But now I'm curious, have you felt that totems are an annoyance for your melee build or ranged build? And if so, do you think that they should be shifted to a more nominal supporting role? Maybe instead we should see a bunch of new supporting skills like Mirage Archer or Tornado that could completely replace totems and have some sort of restriction so you can't use both at once. So let me know some of those thoughts along with your experiences playing Scourge Arrow down in the comments below. A special thanks to my patrons and YouTube channel members. Your support helps keep me independent and allows me to turn down things like sketchy mobile game sponsorships. You can do so for as low as $1 a month over on Patreon. Or if you want to support me completely for free, then you can join the community by hopping into my Discord, link below. If you want more content, check out my second channel, 10 Gaming Thoughts. It's a place that I use to review games, ramble my way through video essays, and a lot more. Or of course, you can just click the suggested video in the card right now. I hope you learned something today, and maybe I'll see you again sometime soon.